Um, you see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanted to, I'm going to go through this a little fast and just kind of share some principles and really the, obviously the principles you teach the next generations are the same ones we need to hear ourselves. And I would just encourage all of you that said, you know, it was good to hear it again, that, um, you know, it's good for me to hear it again too. You never get to where it just comes second nature. It's always uh, really helpful to just spend time, you know, anytime you get a chance to, to hear something. But the same principles apply to our, our kids. Um, but I want to save some time near the end to kind of talk about what we did, not as a blueprint, but um, just what worked for us and encourage you uh, to create your own plan. Um, but obviously teaching our children anything is important. And if we, if we believe this topic is important, then we ought to teach our kids this topic. So uh, Proverbs 22, 6, train for child in the way he should go. And even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Um, and then Ephesians 6, Verse four, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, and this is, it's really two passages in Deuteronomy that kind of say the same thing, but it's um, really, I think, a good way to think about how to teach or anyone, but particularly those in your house. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them <coughs> on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And then a few chapters later, kind of the same thing. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down. And when you get up, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So this kind of conveys the idea of teaching as you go and not just, you know, having, of course, it'd be, you know, you should have, you know, family dedicated time to study the word, but it's even any opportunities you have that you should talk about this all the time. And, you know, you know I grew up in a, in a Christian home, but what we didn't talk about um, spiritual things a lot. Um, and that was a contrast when I married Mindy and we started, I started spending time with her family, just like it seemed like every conversation somehow got to Jesus. And I thought, wow, this is, I mean, everything that Jesus comes up in every conversation. And it was a little bit different for me, but I think that's how you put it in your heart, but even in the hearts of your children as you talk about it. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to preach everything, but but you have to talk about these things. Um, and, you know, if you look at how Jesus taught, um, of course he did a lot of talking, but he, he talked in stories. Um, but kind of four principles for training our kids from, from how Jesus did it is that a lot of it was experiential. Um, so they, they need to experience what's being taught. You can just tell them, here's what you do um, and if any of you had children, you know how that <laughs> generally doesn't work. They have to experience it. Um, and they have to experience it more than once. Uh, and they must have opportunity to fail. Um, you know, and that's a, a lesson in every endeavor of your life that, you know, failure is a much better teacher than success. Um, you know, I always, when somebody makes a bad mistake at work, I always, and they feel really bad. I said, well, that's probably a mistake you'll never make again. And they said, yeah, you're right. I said, well, then count that uh, as opportunity to learn. You have to give you know, constant feedback um, and there should be rewards. Um, you know, our, our economy is based on uh, rewards and the, whatever plan you have to teach them needs to include that. So it's important to understand kind of what we're trying to do is one, create financial boundaries in a boundaryless society. I think of, you know, when I was growing up, my parents didn't teach me a lot about money, but credit cards kind of didn't exist. And they certainly didn't exist for teenagers and college students. It wasn't 
I was in college in the in the early '80s, and that was when um, gas cars first came available. So my first credit card was a Gulf Oil car, which became BP. But you didn't have Visa and Mastercard and American Express. They existed, but you didn't get those before you got a job and had a credit record. Um, so my parents didn't teach me about the dangers of credit cards because people didn't you didn't use them. Um, some of you that are my age uh, and older remember, you know, we used to go and buy my clothes for school and put them on layaway. So we would buy them, leave them at the store until we could come back and pay for them instead of putting them on a credit card. So that was our boundary. You didn't get your clothes till you paid for it. But now with credit being so easy to access, there it's more of a, it is a boundaryless society and you don't run into boundaries until it's much too late. Um, you want to teach them that their that resources are limited. Um, and, and eventually, at some point, you want to transfer financial responsibility. And maybe the biggest one is you want to allow them to fail when the consequences are low. And if they spend all their money, they can't do anything, they still have a place to come home to live and have food on the table. So you want to have them to learn to fail and have consequences when they're perhaps not low in their eyes, but uh, in the grand scheme of things, the consequences are fairly low. So if you don't hear anything else, um, these are, this is the main way you teach kids anything, but particularly about money. And again, you know, while my parents didn't teach me, you know, and sit down, here's how you handle your money. I learned a lot from them by what they did. So in parenting, whether it's finances or anything, more is caught than taught. So they're going to observe and see and pattern what they do much more than they'll do what you try to teach them. And while they may not be good listeners, they are excellent imitators. Um, so because of that, it's important to let them observe what you want them to see. You know, the patterns that you want them to follow, make sure that they observe you doing that. So the question that always comes up is when do you start teaching them? Um, and, and two things, you can start teaching them when they count, but you really need to start teaching them when you start having to say no. And then at some level, you kind of start shifting responsibility to them. And we'll talk about what, what we did. Um, but you, know, you don't wait till they're <clears throat> about to go off to college or their first job this should be something that you're, you're teaching them all along. And, you know, it's, but at the same time, it's never too late to start either. So start as early as you can, but, but start sometime. So as you, you try to create a spending plan and teach boundaries and that resources are limited, you need to help them come up with a spending plan. Not unlike a spending plan for ourselves, um, but a spending plan should include a plan. So actually deciding where your money's going or where the money is gonna go and it needs a control system. And that's, you know, that's exactly the thing for, for everyone. And it's no different for children. It's just gonna look, you know, maybe simpler, the plan and the control system will look a little different um, for the kids, but it's the same thing. You gotta have a plan you got to have a system of control and you need to continue to constantly renew it, uh, review it. So here's some ideas. Um, and these are some principles that you'll see hopefully played out in our plan, but they, they need to have cash in order to learn how to spend it. So pay them in some form, whether it's an allowance or salary, Dave Ramsey calls it a commission. Um, but you can, that's kind of up to you. Um, you know, we gave allowances and we paid for specific jobs, but along with your allowance came some responsibility. So it wasn't really paying you for jobs. Was, you, know, you have responsibility being part of our family and then part of our family, you get an allowance. That doesn't have to be what you do, but that's what we did. But somehow you need to have a system where they generate income. Um, and like, you know, we gave them allowance, but we also paid them for special projects. You know, really easy plan that we did and we didn't come up with this, but 
implement a 10, 1080 plan, kind of like um, uh, Brett was saying a couple of weeks ago, uh, give, save, and live on the rest. So 10% goes to giving, 10% to saving, and 80% is for spending. And, and we created, you know, tangible banks for each one of these. And open a savings account. You know, it's um, savings account used to work better when interest rates were above 0.001%. So it doesn't create quite the visual that it used to create, uh, but still they can have a savings account and see growth. And as they put money in it, it can grow. But we didn't talk a lot about systems of control for, uh, for grownups, but you know, always a good place to start if you're struggling is to use the envelope system. Uh, and, and here we're, we're not so much trying to teach budgeting as we are cash control. Um, so you don't want to get as focused on how they spend their money, but how they allocate it and recognize there is a limit uh, and that they need to have some way to control. Um, and so, like I said, you know, we start with give, save and spend. But as they get older, you can add, you know, categories for them to be able to give gifts to each other and the family or whatever, and then to, to buy their own clothes. I mean, you can think of other things too, but um, whatever responsibility you turn over to them, it's a good idea to teach them a way to save for and control those. So some parental guidance, don't bail them out. Uh, again, we're in a situation where the consequences are low um, it's going to be really painful for them, but they're probably going to live through it. Uh, so resist the temptation to bail them out. You know, and, and one thing you, you don't want to make this principle a law. So, you know, maybe bail them out sometimes, but just resist that temptation. And the, the more pain they have, the more they're going to learn and give them freedom. This was really hard for me when they would buy something I think I didn't think they needed or, thought, or, or in my mind knew they were going to regret, but just give them the freedom to do it because that, again, that's how they're going to learn. They're not going to learn from you saying, you're not going to want this, you know, in, in two days and you're wishing you didn't do it. They're, they're not going to understand that. So give them the freedom. Um, when they run out of money, teach them how to find more. Um, so they want, that's the perfect time to help work and teach a work ethic that you, know, you want more things, you want more freedom, you need to work for it. So again, I know I'm going through this fairly quickly, but a lot, there's a lot of rewards from using this system uh, for not only for our kids, but also for us. You learn the reward for working and generating more income um, the value of saving, uh, you know, you give up something today, but eventually you save up enough and you, and you can buy it because you've saved for it. But if you're not saving, you possibly can never uh, get what you want. Uh, you learn that the supply of money is limited. Um, you know, if we're continually giving them money when, and bailing them out, then um, they don't understand that there's a limited supply. That helps decision making. So when I know they're going to not want this thing in 24 hours, but when they experience it, that's going to help them in their decision making in the future. And it does learn, help them learn to budget, um, set goals, um, and then the blessing of giving. And I think what that does is, you know, all of us have at some level, some desire to bless others and to give. And if they've got, you know, a bank of money to give away and they have this tug on their heart to give, they've got the resources given and they can do it. And then they can feel good about it and not just, hey, I wish I could help this person, but they've got something they can give and they can give it away and, and actually uh, have the blessing that comes from, from, from giving. So here's some ideas, um, you know, if you just you Google give, save, spend and all of these pop up, um, you know, I think we started with 
tennis ball cans, which maybe these are like Pringles cans. Um, but I like the idea of having a, a clear that they can actually see the money in it. And that's actually a good idea to have, you know, Bible verses to encourage each of the spots. But, you know, it's really easy to do. And it, it's a great visual. One of the things that that somebody shared with me one time that I, I tried to teach Lon and Ben was in this give, save, spin, you know, you put, you, know, you get money and you split it up uh, in each of these. And we encourage them to do 10, 10 and 80, but you can, all, you can move money from the right to left, but you can never move money from left to right. So if you're designating money to give, you can't say, oh, never mind, I don't want to give that. Now I want to save it or spend it. And the same for saving. But if you have money in your spending jar, you can give that away or you can say, I want to save more and move it to the left. But the principle is you can move money to the right, uh, I mean, to the, to the left, but not to the right. Uh, so that was a good visual, I thought. And it helps with priorities, you know, spending is all about priorities. So here's, here's what we did. Um, and Mindy and Lon, love for you guys to jump in uh, and share um, any thoughts. But, you know, just like our personal spending plans, we tried a lot of different things. And finally, we're convinced that the thing that we should do uh, was to give Lon and Ben responsibility for some of the things they do. I, I, I think they were probably about 12 and 10. I don't know if you have a different reckon, memory of that. I think I was going into fifth grade is my memory, but maybe not. So you would have been 11 years, is that right? More or less, yeah. Um, and so they're two years apart. So that was important, but we decided to do it at the same time. So we had been, we had budgeted because we're accountants. We had budgeted an amount of money for them to give them an allowance and for buying their clothes. And we had not really talked about them being actually given. So we did kind of did, you know, we'll give you this much money to buy clothes, this much money for spending and then added, you know, 10% so they can give 10% to. Um, so I remember this very vividly. Um, it might be interesting to hear Lon's perspective of when we announced this. We were on a trip and we we're in a car in our van, our white Privia van. Um, and we're in the front seat and they're sitting in the captain's chair behind us. And we share that, you know, we're gonna start doing our finances different. Um, we're going to give you X amount of money. This much is for you to buy your own clothes. We're not going to buy your clothes anymore. You get to, because that was always a battle of them wanting to buy things that the kids had to have then. And of course we are accountants and <laughs> didn't want to do that. So this took that argument away. That's another benefit is that it eliminates the, the arguments as long as you don't bail them out. And so Back then we were, you know, young and fairly frugal and didn't spend a lot of things. We actually didn't have cable, which in Atlanta isn't as bad as you think because we had about 15 channels on broadcast. Um, so we shared that this is what we're going to do. And, and Ron, do you, do you remember this? You want to share how, what your perception of that day was? Do you remember that? Lauren. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh. You're talking to mom. Um, yeah, as far as I remember, um, and I know we've talked about this before, uh, but I uh, was very disappointed with that announcement um, because uh, I just immediately saw the limitation of it and was like, oh, so there's going to be like a finite amount of money that I can spend on things, and I gotta, I gotta make those decisions now, and I can't just convince you to pay for something nice for me anymore. I can't just like beg you enough. Um, but Ben was super excited because he could buy all the candy he wanted because we could spend the money on whatever we wanted. Um, so he saw uh, 
I guess the freedom of it. And I saw all the limitations of it. And I guess and it really was, it was both right. We we're just looking at two different sides of the coin. Um, it's uh, freedom through limitation. So Ben actually got very excited and started thinking of all the things that he could buy because now he had more money. Um, so I think that, you know, kind of points out a couple of things. One, they were different ages, um, but they had a totally different perspective of what this was going to mean in their life. Um, so that's what we did. We, we helped them. I don't, I think we gave them the three banks and said, um, or maybe four now and had money they had to set aside. I think Lon <laughs> actually uh, made a duct tape wallet to put one of his <laughs> categories in. Um, so he was, got a little creative with that. Um, but you know, what that did was help us again, eliminate the, the battle of going to the store and buying clothes. So they could buy, you know, one polo shirt or three or four other shirts. And if they got the polo shirt, then that's the shirt they wore to school every day. Um, so they had to, they, they learned through that. Um, anything in particular comes to mind for you, Mindy, as we kind of started that journey? Sorry. Um, no, it is funny though. You said you remembered it very specifically, but I, I have a different memory. I remember we were sitting at the kitchen table and <laughs> we had the conversation. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. Um, but, um, going back to don't rescue, I do have a real mem vivid memory about, um, don't rescue them because I remember, I never thought my parents had any trouble you know, letting me have my consequences and not rescuing me. But so I didn't, I was surprised when it, when it was hard for me sometimes, but I particularly remember when, um, one time Ben bought, um, what are those brand name sunglasses? Yeah. Oak, Oakley. So it was like Oakley. a big, like tea pain, right. Oakley's giant. <laughs> he bought a pair of sunglasses with like two months of his clothing budget. And I just remember I tried, I tried to tell him, you know, you're going to want summer clothes, you know, do you really want to do this? And he just really, really wanted to buy these sunglasses. So I let him and, um, and then he lamented that he didn't have enough shorts and things. And I really, really wanted to get him some shorts, but I just really had to stand firm and not do that. And it was, I think it was a really life-changing lesson for him. I think it really, um, you know, taught him a lot, but, um, and I didn't say any, I didn't, you know, I wasn't like, oh, well, you know, I guess you shouldn't have bought those, you know, he, he figured it out. It, it was obvious for him. So, um, so anyways, but I, it was more me struggling with not bailing him out. I really struggled with that more than I thought I would, but, um, but I was really glad that I did not bail him out because it was a really good lesson. Another thing that was hard was when they had money and we built the um, FEC at North Atlanta and they had coat machines. Um, so we got to church and they had a dollar in their pocket. They were going to the coat machine um, to get a coat. And you know, that was a freedom. We gave them, it was very hard, um, but we let that happen. And that's how you know, they decided to spend their money. Um, and I think, you know, the for us, that's where we had the battle, not so much the sodas as the, the clothes. That's where we had a, most of our spending battle. So we just shifted the responsibility to them. Um, and it, it was hard. Um, we continue to buy a lot of things for them. Like we always bought all their sports equipment and you know, things that for school and, and things like that. But you know, if they wanted to go out with their friends uh, or buy their clothes, they, they had to have their own money. Um, what else have we, did we learn from that process? Um, I do recall Ben um, in college, um, we were standing in his bedroom and he's looking in his closet and sees a row of 
polo shirts and thought, wow, that's a lot of wasted money. <laughs> so he really had a revelation. You know, even if he didn't learn it when he was a teenager and still living at home, he had that lesson later on because he experienced it and you know bought things that he probably really didn't need. Um, and probably the, the biggest thing that surprised to me, um, they both learned to be very frugal. Um, <laughs> I hope you don't mind me saying this, but they, they transitioned from Ralph Lauren to Goodwill. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and, I'm wearing a, a thrift store shirt currently. <laughs> But, you know, we never could have convinced them to buy their clothes from the thrift store. We didn't even, that was totally on their own that they came up with that because they had constraints and they got creative. Um, and I don't know if you started it, but, you know, all their friends buy clothes from Goodwill too um, because they learned, you know, they, they got creative. And, you know, they, you don't learn unless you know, have some pain to create, you know, I think what I found was that I, because y'all wouldn't give me money to go out and eat or go out to a movie or go to a theme park or this, that, the other, um, is that I was missing out on things that I wanted to go to with my friends because I had spent all my money on a new pair of shoes or new clothes and was, I still wanted to do both of those things. So I had to find a cheaper way to buy clothes. Um, I don't remember, I think a friend from high school, um, just asked me one time like sophomore year of high school or something if I wanted to go hang out at a thrift store or something and then realized that they actually have some good stuff there sometimes and they were like three dollars it's like that's crazy um you just have to look for it and put a little more work into it but um that was kind of my way of being able to buy new clothes and go out and do the things that I wanted to do um uh, with my friends um it was a very good motivator Probably wouldn't have been very motivating if we had suggested it. <laughs> you know, again, I want to encourage you to think through how you do this for your family. Um, and, and, you know, we adapted and we didn't always do it the same way. Um, but we came up with a plan and we kept working it. And I, I tell you that um, there's a lot of things I'm proud of both Lon and Ben for. Um, but they both are very responsible with finances. When they went off to college, um, their grandparents had given them some money and we just gave it to them and said, this is your spending money through college. Um, and you know, it wasn't a, a significant amount of money. Um, and Ben came close to running out, um, but it, one made it last and they both made it last um, we didn't have any reservation giving them that freedom because we observed them learning how to manage money from fifth grade to twelfth grade and not without pain not without mistakes um, but the sooner you get them on the plan to doing it the faster they're going to learn and the, the sooner the ability to be able to transfer that financial responsibility um, Any other thoughts either of you, Lon or Mindy? Um, I think something that was helpful for me um, growing up was that y'all did, y'all gave us uh, an allowance that wasn't like, it was enough for a child to have fun with and to be able to buy food and stuff on occasion with, um, but it wasn't like an exceeding amount to where I wasn't having to worry about it. It was still like a very limited amount. Um, but I think something that was important about it was that it came with stipulations. So I didn't just get it no matter what I had to do. I had a certain number of chores. I had to keep my room clean. I had to clean up in the bathroom, like, you know, wipe down the sink and clean up like once a week and sweep the floors and whatnot. Um, and if I, I kind of had a, I guess a short list of chores that I had to do every week. And if I didn't do them, then that would, it would uh, negatively impact my uh, financial gains for the week. Um, and then if I wanted more money, I had the option to go and do extra things. I could go and cut the grass or I could go pull weeds or paint a room or repair a hole in the wall that we made earlier or something. Um, 
Uh, so I think that that kind of helped uh, helped me to put together work equals money and, and less work equals less money and no work equals no money. Um, which I think at a young age, it's good to kind of get that into people's heads um, because that is reality a lot of times. So, um, so that way, when I went off and was on my own, I just kind of already had that formula in my head. It was like, oh, I want to do things that cost money. I better go get a job. <laughs> um, so that was very helpful. Thank you for that. Anybody have any questions? Or ideas? Did they do? Yeah, I have a question. All right. Uh, what? How come you ended up choosing fifth grade as the time frame? That's when we came up with the idea. That wasn't okay. really that we didn't really pick that time. That's when we were convinced of that that we needed to do it, and that just happened to be the age they were. Um, so, so Ben would have been in third grade. Um, so, I think, you know, in our experience even third grade, it might've even been a little sooner, we could have transitioned some, the, the clothing issue, at least in third grade, if not sooner. Uh, but but we, we could have done more things earlier than that. And I think at, at some level, you need to start teaching some things about money um, even, early, even earlier than that. I think Other thing. we started it because the clothing was starting to be an issue. I think they were starting to really beg for more and more, and it was starting to get to be a, an ordeal. And I think we thought, you know, this is a way to, to fix this. That's what I was going to say. I think it was, I was getting to the age where that was becoming more and more of a big deal socially to like have the appropriate popular things. Um, certain kind of shoes, certain kind of clothes and whatnot. And it was uh, at that age, like, you know, your social standing is all that you can think about. So that was, <laughs> um, was starting to, like they said, uh, ask more and more emphatically for, for more and more expensive things. Um, and so they're like, all right, you want it? Here's some money. You can go buy them if you want, or you can do other things. So David, how would you suggest teaching some of these um, lessons to younger kids? Um, like I have a one and three year old and I, they both have their own bank accounts that we opened when they were little. Um, but for Olivia, she just turned three and we have, j instead of just transferring money into her bank account um, every month that she still doesn't know exists, um, now we've started um, giving her chores. She she got her first chores on her third birthday. Um, so she gets a quarter every time she feeds the dog and she gets a dollar every time she helps pick up sticks in the yard before we mow the lawn. So she's starting to recognize that she has her own money, um, but doesn't quite know what that means yet. Um, so how do you kind of teach some of those concepts to like young children, like three and four? Well, I, I don't have a good silver bullet for you, but I would, I would look for some books on that. But one thing that, I would, that comes to mind is, um, is if she can buy some things, has some things she wants, then help her kind of make a list of things she wants um, and, and show her how much they cost and you know, you want five toys, but you only have enough to buy one. So you've got to figure out how to prioritize what you want. And because a lot of times, you know, it's true for us too. We see something, we go buy it. And then, you know, very soon there's something else we want. Um, but just kind of help her see how she can save up to buy things. And it costs $5 and you have three. So here's how much time it'll take you to get up to five so you can buy that thing. And what you could do um, is even have kind of a matching program that, you know, you don't want to give her so much that, you know, she can you know, say, if, if you say for this thing, I'll help you buy that thing. Um, because you may, not, you may not give her enough to buy 
something to really teach a lesson, but you could say, if you save this much money, we'll help you with, with this much. Yeah, she's already picked out a dress that she wants, so that's what she's working on. <laughs> there you go. Another thing we did was we involved in, in, in our finances at a pretty early age. We didn't show them all of everything, but you know, often there would be a question, why don't we do this? You know, everybody else is doing this and we don't do this. So we gave an answer to them. Um, you know, and our answer primarily was, you know, we made a, we have a very strong priority of giving. So we, we may have as much, but we've decided we're going to give as much. And so that limits us some. And we also are saving for retirement. So you don't have to take care of us when we're old. So kind of explain why we don't do some of the things we do and we don't just spend all the money we have. And, you know, sometimes we say we could do that. We have enough money to do that, but we're deciding not to. And, you know, they may never, they may not understand that, but they have heard the decision. And I would say that's one of the things I learned from my parents. We were, we were a middle-class family. We weren't wealthy, but we weren't poor. Uh, but, you know, my parents always drove old cars. Um, we never went out to eat. Um, we did without things. And, and, and my friends were all doing those things. Uh, not all of them, but some of them. But they lived very frugally. And so I learned. And that's, uh, I didn't learn right away. <laughs> but when I got out, I learned about credit cards and, and used them. But eventually I said, okay, well, this probably isn't the best way to live life. And I could think back to how my parents did. And so, I think that's important to, at some level, share your finances with the kids. Maybe not at three, but you know, as they start to be able to understand, um, sacrifice more. Any other questions? Thoughts? I guess I have another question, um, which isn't really applicable to me, but um, how do you, so if for some, by chance, you didn't teach these lessons to your children um, during their like childhood and adolescent years, how do you, or is it even possible to teach kind of these concepts to adult children. Um, like if you didn't teach your 12 and 13 year old, this is your money and I'm not bailing you out. How would you teach your 20, 30, 40 year old? Well, that's a great question. Well, one thing I don't think you can teach them if you don't understand it yourself. Um, so that would be step one um, and, and live it out. And so some, some it could be because you know, you didn't do it while they were growing up and they didn't even observe it. So mm -hmm. I think, again, I think that's, you know, again, if you didn't hear anything else, they're going to learn what they see much more than they learn what you tell them. Um, so if they didn't do that either. Then one, you got to admit it, say, I, we've learned this and now we know we're, we did it wrong. Uh, we found a better way. Um, and it, you got to, especially if they're, you know, really adult and on their own, not just kind of college or just starting out, they got to want to learn. Um, but if they do want to learn, uh, you know, just humbly, you know, share, this is what we learned. Um, and this is, you know, why we think it's a better way. Um, but if they've never observed you doing it and, and don't hear that you've changed and learned and grown, then it's not going to, that's not going to help. Um, and I think you know, what we've also observed with you know, Lon and Ben both now um, out on their own for the first time that that we've become much smarter <laughs> uh, because they are more they want to hear what we have to say because they're doing things they never did before. So I think even if we had done things wrong, that's a really unique special opportunity to pour into them, you know, some truths about, you know, finances that they're not going to hear anywhere else. Um, 
you know, the reality is we're not hearing that in, in churches very much. Um, and if you're not learning it at home, you know, what you're going to learn from, from college or from Visa and MasterCard and the banks is going to be the wrong message. Um, so the first step would be to figure it out yourself um, and then kind of humbly transition it uh, to the extent they would listen. And a lot of that is about protecting your influence with them, um, protecting your influence by maintaining a relationship even when things aren't going well, um, but just you know, protecting your influence uh, and to the extent you protect that influence and they're willing to listen and hear, then you can have influence, but, but you really have to protect that influence. Anything else? Well, I appreciate the, the honor at the beginning of the class, but I really enjoyed um, the privilege of teaching the class. Um, like I said, you know, it's good to have a refresher for everybody. I, for a long time, I made a commitment that I would find one financial book and read it every year. And I haven't done that recently, but I did for many years. Um, and, and every time I either taught a class or read a book, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I've heard before, but just to have it continually reinforced um, and from a different perspective, um, it's really helpful. I don't think I shared this, but this is another thing that was really important in your teaching children, especially if you have more than one. Um, and Ron and Judy Blue said this, I heard this first from them, but as you're teaching your children, as we were teaching Lon and Ben, who are alike in a lot of ways, but very different in a lot of ways, you, because you love them equally, you parent them uniquely because they're different. And the same, the lessons don't work the same for each. Um, you know, Lon and Ben were alike in a lot of ways, but they're different in a lot of ways. But what worked for Lon wouldn't always work for Ben. So you have permission to parent them differently because you love them the same. That was some really great wisdom, I thought, that helped us. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, as the youngest, um, your parents get better <laughs> as you learn. And, and I, I know that things were easier for me in a lot of ways because they, the things they learned from parenting my brother and sister. Um, and it's probably the same way for, for Ben too. We learned a lot of things, even though it was only two years. But you know, just don't feel like you have to treat them the same all the time. You want to be fair, but you don't always have, they don't have to be equal. You know, anybody that's on the call that um, might have thought I had any wisdom to share, I would be more than willing to have conversations offline. Um, so feel free to reach out. If you have questions that you think I might can help with, um, we'd love to be a resource.